and we are live. All right, we're joined live this hour by an uh, incredible poet, author, um, art space organizer, organizer, uh, revolutionary, uh, uh, Dora Magana. Um, Dora, it's, it's really just a really just a, a, an honor to have you on here. I remember that when we first met, uh, or or not when we first met, but but in some of the early readings I I seen you at um, was like the Red House and the Corazon del Pueblo. And um, I remember you doing a reading where you were you were talking about um, you know revolutionary women you had known in the struggle. And um, after you would finish each poem, you would turn around, you had you had slides of them, and you would clap for them. I I'd never seen anything so inspirational as that. So that that's always that's always stuck with me. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, about your your writing and your work? Um, thank you for inviting me to this interview. I really appreciate it. And I remember those times in which we started to read together. I do remember them. They were so beautiful in Corazón del Pueblo and Casa de Poesia. Um, and yes, I remember I did honor in those poems uh, several women I met and to still keep coming, their biographies keep coming every day through Facebook by different friends, you know, and I have been able to write about them and also uh, started a painting um, a project in which I will paint this woman whose pictures have been sent to me by several of, of uh, old uh, revolutionary friends, you know. So, uh, what was the question? <laughs> Sorry. Oh no. Uh, you know what? Let, let's let's start earlier than that. Can you tell us like um, how you how you um, when did you first like start writing? When did you first start getting into uh, into into writing poetry? How, how did that journey begin? Well, I remember writing my first poem when I was eight years old. You know, I was a member of the uh, so-called little orchestra in the school. You know, or Christina in the school, and I wrote the first poem around that time to be musicalized by one of our uh, teachers and it was regarding my homeland because I did not grow in my homeland. I grew up in another country. So uh, I was born in El Salvador and grew up in Guatemala. So that was my first time I remember poet, writing poetry. And then during, um, there was, a, I remember at school, we did work on uh, a poetry contest and I participated with one when I was around 13 years old. So it has been a constant. I wrote in El Salvador and I uh, gave some of my poems to my friends for them to be high because at that time it was very risky to write what I was writing. And uh, well, those words have disappeared because we really don't know where they are. And uh, um, then I spent several years writing poetry and burning it. I, there are several people who do that. Okay, they can destroy their own work. So I was writing and burning my work, writing and burning my work until 2000 and um, eight, in which I wrote, I went through a process of grieving uh, classes, I will say, or workshops, in which I was able to process all the grieving from the years in, of the war and all the losses in my life. And, and there was pretty big, pretty big amount of work, you know, emotional work. And after I started to process all this grief that was stuck in somewhere in my body, in my chest, that I was able to wake up one day, sit down in front of the computer and wrote a whole uh, book of poems in one month. And they were dedicated to those people who felt in El Salvador, who were disappeared or who were killed by the fascist government at that time. And uh, um, that was the, the first work that I did not <clears throat> burn. I, of course, was going to erase it because in the computer, you don't burn, you just can't. <laughs> I, I was going to leave it. I'm so thankful that my friend, colleague, and great artist, great, uh, I mean, um, uh, 
uh, culture worker, Ricardo Garcia Miami, uh, was around and he helped me not to delete my work. And he also helped me to keep writing and correcting me. You know, and he will edit me and then we get somebody else to edit work. We publish it ourselves as Central American Cultural Center, you know, as part of the, the work of the Central American Cultural Center. And I am also so thankful to Oriel Maria Siu and also to one of the greatest Salvadorian poets uh, and writers of here at the United States, Oscar Remy Benitez, who helped me in the whole process of publishing and, and guided me quite in the process of publishing. So that's how the poems came finally to be part of books, you know. Um, during the years of the war, I did write, um, and it was more propaganda uh, than than any other thing. Yeah, that's how writing came up. So when when you were when you were writing propaganda, like what was um, what were some of the like uh, I'm always curious about this, like when, when you know because you're you were involved in a you know in a political struggle, you're involved in a in a. You know, let me let me tell you because this I have shared, but I I have shared with people personally, but I would like this to remain as an as as part of the history of of, of our history. You know, uh, what happened is that I was a member of an organization in El Salvador and I was assigned to the propaganda committee. Okay, and in that propaganda committee. Um, was developed in what is called the Salvadorian swamp. You know, so we had this swamp with alligators and really, really uh, small channels that enter through the land and has the trees that are called mangle, who, whose the roots are really down on earth, but when the ocean fills, those roots stay be below the ocean, you know, and then there are little channels. All this is um, salty water, okay? There are little channels, and in the middle of the man, uh, of the what is called the manglar, which is the swamp, there are little islands. And when the people from the area, the fishermen and fisherwomen of that area, they uh, show us those little islands. So we were installed in a little island in which we built the whole print shop, um, the propaganda committee. I had a writing, a typing machine of all those typing machines. You remember that they need electricity? Okay, and we, we, I will write there all the, well, I mean, it was, it was called Parte de Guerra, so it's uh, all the information of what was going on and the struggle that was taking place in the city. And we will develop all this propaganda uh, and give it to the people so it could be transferred to the cities and it could be transferred to the um, uh, countryside and to the troops, you know. So it was, um, it was very active. So then, we had a military invasion over the area, and they got to our island. But we moved before the army got to our island. And we moved everything. Can you imagine a mimeographo? Um, that was amazing. It was a mimeographo. Um, and it was also the typewriter, and all the paper, and all the printing because we use serigraphy a lot for the for the pictures of the of the newspaper, you know. So we use serigraphy, all those serigraphy uh, equipments being moved, and we built. And this is amazing because that was done by the by the fishermen and the people in the area inside the what will be the the swamp. Um, I will say bosque, how will you say forest? The swamp forest, because it was all water, okay? We built, and they, they were the ones who did the physical work, um, build what is called platforms, you know, made of mangling trees. With the platforms in which we will live, hang our hammocks among the trees to sleep, 
and I sleep in the hammocks all the time and live there and cook there and had the propaganda committee there, you know, making the propaganda happen. So that was a lot of people's effort. Good morning. That was a lot of people's efforts and that was a lot of uh, people's, um, um, oh my God, how to say this? It's a, is what we call the accumulation of forces, the accumulation of work that we did at that time. And people, those, those uh, clandestine structure of, of fishermen building all these things for the propaganda of the people to happen. And that was an amazing experience. I will never forget it. I have not wrote about that. I have only write a poem to the team, you know, to that propaganda team. Uh, but I would like uh, this to be recorded and saying this happened in El Salvador. Yeah. And I am going to write, I'm starting to write back again uh, little stories because I don't have a, a whole timeline, you know, of all what happened. But little things, little stories that happen, and this is one of the stories I'm working on. So what, what was the name of the press or the collective, or can you share that? Or uh, that yeah, Estrella Roja, Red Star. Red Star, Estrella Roja. Wow. I've been, uh, published them, some poetry of uh, some of the famous, like Otto René Castillo from Guatemala, one of his poems when, when we had these incredible uh, strikes, workers, workers strikes in San Salvador in the middle of the war, we will publish what they were doing and some poems from Torre de Castillo. I mean, that was, uh, and then some theory, some, uh, some Marxist theory in, in, the, in the little pamphlets, you know, like little things for the, for the people to, to read and study. Yeah, yeah. So how, how would you say that, um, you know, having a background in poetry, how did that affect uh, your ability to write like a good agit propaganda? Like was it, was it, was it some similarities, was it different or, you know? I, I am trying to hear that. Oh, okay. Okay, so, so, so you know, you've been writing, po at this point in time, you've been writing poetry for, you know, decades, right? Or you've, you've been writing poetry most of your life that you can remember. Um, and so how did your, your practice of writing poetry help you as uh, in writing, ag uh, you know, agitational propaganda, what, did it help you, or is it completely different, or was it similar? Uh, it was. It's, 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 it's different. I, I will say it's different because the propaganda is like reports. You know, you're reporting what it's happening. Uh, but uh, you know, poetry. I mean, like like whoever writes poetry, write other thing, other things too. Most of us write multiple things. The thing with poetry is that it's an alternative language, you know, and then we use it alternatively and we use the, the, the images in a different way. It's, it's, um, so it did, poetry helped, I mean, all writing and all reading helps, you know, because really, uh, and this is uh, a take many poets and many writers have is that we really read a lot, you know? So all the reading done during the high school years, during the, and on those years too, because whatever fell from my hands, I would read at that time, you know? So um, it helped me a lot in writing. So it's the writing and the reading and the practice that makes you. I never went to study uh, I have never, well, I have studied literature, but in, in my general education class, you know, and a few extra that I took because I really like literature. So, but I will say in terms of poetry, I have read a lot. I read a lot since I was a little kid. I have to say here that Darío, Ruben Darío was one of my uh, idols and Pablo Neruda at that time and Sor Juan Inés de la Cruz, you know, all these uh, Writers, uh, I read them a lot when I was, uh, I mean, all my elementary school and um, grade school and then high school, you know. So, um, but basically I'm a self-made poet. You know, I have taken one 
wow, this is interesting because I have taken one writing, one poetry writing uh, workshop one day or two days. And uh, that's what I have done in terms of, of formally trying to educate myself. Yeah. So, okay. So, I mean, I, I'm still recovering from the story you just told me. That was, in, that was incredible. You, uh, you, uh, yeah. You're talking about like floating, clandestine floating barracks. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, uh, writing, writing, you know, the agit prop of the revolution. That's, that's, a, that's an incredible. How did you, how did you get involved? Uh, with uh, uh, Estrella Roja, how did you get involved with with, uh, with these individuals? Well, Estrella Roja. Well, it was it was um, in high school that I got involved in the students' movement. You know, that was uh, struggling at that time for the reindication of the students. You know, no fee in the schools, like free books, uh, and was very supportive that movement of the workers' movement of the factory worker movement and the peasants movement that at that time was taking out the land and uh, keeping uh, the land and um, uh, the uh, women who worked in the marketplace who were fiddle in all our protests and the people in Los Tuburios, which is the ghettos, you know, the so-called ghettos in, that were very poor without water, without light and electricity. So we, that was the movement, you know, how, how I perceived that movement at that time, and I incorporated through the students' unions to that movement. And they, at that time, I remember I started to write po uh, propaganda to you know, and doing it and doing it. Then uh, this movement evolved into what was the big amount of people that incorporated into guerrillas and the organization of the re of the of the people in the in the um, uh, in what was called the control zones. You know. And these, these sons had people who were living in the countryside, who were peasants, who were planting, and at the same time were defending the land because, uh, and they had to flu, flee some of their uh, villages to those fronts and install themselves there because of the of the uh, repression and the National Guard coming and burning their villages and then they will come and gather together and create what was the community um, consejos comunitarios which was a community groups that will direct how the 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 land was distributed how it was planted how the crops were taken into were, were hide and were feeding people and that was a huge movement. That's how I got involved into this. And then someday, uh, someone asked me, would you like to start a propaganda committee? And I say, or be part or member of this propaganda committee within this condition? And I say, yes. OK, and we started the propaganda committee. Yeah. Uh, I had been organizing what is the, the I have been working organizing uh, and this, this, this takes groups of people doing this. It was not just one person. It's, there is no one hero, okay, in this, in, this, uh, in this process, because some people say, oh, you did this, you did that. And, and I usually, I used to say more than now, we did this, we did that, because this was a collective human effort, which was big and took a lot of thinking, planning, and doing. You know, it was groups of uh, peasants, students, uh, intellectuals, uh, uh, factory workers meeting in the war fronts and deciding how was going to be organized what was the popular power. So uh, at that time, it was like everybody had their own gift I was taken as it is and built over that gift, you know? So I wrote and 
it was my that was taking before that i have been working with groups of people organizing for was the expansion zones in one war front in which we will go to areas that have been organized in the past but dismantled by the other squads and reorganize them you know and 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 try to work with the people there were there was a there was a, a beautiful experience in which we helped the people to finish building what was a big water tank that they had initiated to uh, uh, like five years before and that because of all the war and all this movement and all this repression, they stopped building and we reorganized and it was rebuilt for that village. It was, it was a lot of social involvement in, in doing this is when people think about the guerrillas, um, they usually think about the military units fighting against the army or the National Guard. Yes, that those those things happen and sometimes you were involved because you were there, you know, so you had to fight. But is this movement didn't organized only that, only its revolutionary army, which was great and big, and had a great offensive in 1989, which really brought uh, the fascist and the United States government to their negotiation table, you know? But also um, there was this incredible, what is grassroots movement of things done that will sustain the efforts of creating a new society. And that is uh, when, when I write now, when in the works I'm writing now, is that level of community commitment and organization that I am putting together in little stories. You know, so that's how I got involved <laughs> in all yeah. this incredible, incredible movement it is incredible it's incredible it's I mean, incredible because when you see it through the lens of history it's like wow this was amazing well, this was an amazing effort of the salvadorian people to defeat the dictatorship the dictatorship that had been in our country for so many years you know and the youth, and it was the youth. I still talk with some of the people from the villages, and we were the same age, you know? And uh, we still talk and said that this was a beautiful effort. You know, that's what I write the points to those. There were people who died and who died fighting. There were people who were disappeared, and other who died in massacres. and. And I remember them, and I want people to know that they existed, you know, that they were uh, alive, and that they were committed to social justice at that time. Yeah, no, it's, it's incredible. I, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's an amazing, it's an amazing, amazing piece, you know, period of history. I mean, so many people think about, you know, living in this country, you're, you're taught to think of the world through only your lens. And you think of the 80s as like this time of like, you know, conspicuous consumption or something like that. But like, there's there's world revolution going on in that time period, you know, in El Salvador. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. But it was also the concept of the creation of popular power that is very important to rescue because people were organized in popular power communities. You know, that will uh, talk in big assemblies, will get what the people wanted, and then condense it and say, okay, so the work we're going to do this is first, let's plant, you know, the crops. Hmm. Second, let's improve the water system. Third, and the, the four or three, three or four main lines of work, you know, and let's keep studying and there was a big literacy campaign inside the troops and the population. And that 
those were it, it was not the destruction of the uh, convoys which happened. And it was not only the, the attacks to big uh, uh, cuarteles, what's called uh, uh, military uh, places. That was done, okay? But it was not only that. At the same time, popular power was built. And that is an amazing word, you know, just in a country where, let's say, 70% of the population didn't read or write to develop those literacy campaigns were an amazing work, you know, in the middle of a war. And in the military offensive over those war fronts and in the middle of bombing and in the middle of, uh, you know, the artillery hitting you all the time, the war keep going and going and going and going for 12 years. I mean, that's incredible. How, how did, I mean, like, I, I know it's kind of like a, I don't know, an odd question, but like, how, how did you, how would you wage a literacy campaign in the middle of a, in the middle of a, in the middle of a war? I mean, particularly amongst the troops. I mean, like how, that, that, that sounds like an incredible feat. Yeah, it was, there was uh, like, uh, uh, people who will organize the groups and teach to people to read and write, and then these people teach others to read and write. It was, you know, it's like when I had this image and have always drawn it in, in my, you know, when you're doing some kind of writing and you draw things. And, and now I, I am realizing at this point that I'm talking with you that I'm going to get some paper and do the drawing here. <laughs> yeah. So I always draw this, and this comes because of the of the of the of that experience, you know. And then, wow! Now I am understanding this drawing, and now I am understanding how it is gonna be placed also on one of my paintings, because. This is so needed. <laughs> <laughs> you see, like this was a group that was uh, okay. This uh, small group here was one person teaching everybody. So now, out of that came another that created the teaching to others, and then another that created the teaching to others. Now, you know, uh, that type of organization is very difficult to destroy because if you hit it here and destroy this, well, this keeps going and it goes to another place, you know? So that is how we were kind of organizing the reading groups and organizing some of the, of the um, support areas. So you have to destroy the whole web in order yeah. to destroy something. Yeah. It, 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 it's, it's fascinating because, you know, like politically, um, I, I'm, a, you know, I'm a communist, right? And I believe in all these things. Um, but my mind being raised in this country still has very capitalist logic or, or has a, the logic of like uh, trained professionals, right? So how could one person teach 100 people as opposed to one person, what you just described? It, it doesn't even occur to my mind that that's possible because I've, been, I've, I've lived in this country so long. I mean, I've lived in this country my whole life. So I've lived under the system so long uh, that I can't even, I can't even think of that, you know, like, so that's, that's, uh, that's very illuminating. It's very, uh, it's very, it's kind of a, a slap in the face. It's kind of a wake up call that, 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 of course, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And then there are some uh, women groups here in the United States, like here in Los Angeles that have used something similar to do health education, you know, in the mm -hmm. local communities. A woman who get the 10 classes, 10 women get the 10 classes, then they create their own group and give 10, those 10 classes to other women. And if one of those women really would like to teach it, learn how to and teach it to other 10 women, you know, that has been done uh, here in, in LA in some projects and yeah, this Pico Union community uh, for, uh, let's say, breast cancer prevention, cervical cancer prevention, and all those uh, 
a good thing that women and uh, should know of for for yeah. help. You know, so I I I saw one project and I was like, I am so proud of you guys for being doing this. Uh, they invited me as a nurse practitioner to speak in their group, and then I spoke uh, a few things, you know. But they had already taken all the classes, and then they were able to process how they were doing this, which is an amazing, and uh, which is an amazing way of doing that. And I, I implemented something like this in a very little scale with immunization, which I do believe in immunization, and I'm not going to enter into this COVID stuff. But I do believe in immunizing people, especially. Um, uh, that I come from a country in which I saw a lot of people dying of the diseases that are preventable at this point. And it was in the late 90s that I did this work in a community, you know, for the basic immunization, like the uh, polio and tetanus and the We didn't have all these fancy immunizations that we have right now. Uh, so... Uh yeah, no. Um, we have uh, there's a big phrase going around right now called uh, called mutual aid. It's, the, 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 it's kind of popular right now. The concept of mutual aid, and you know, the idea that like people helping each. I mean, it's pretty simple. People helping each other, right? But 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 in a very organized fashion. So what you're describing, I think, is is uh, is 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 a uh, uh, organic, tried and, true, tried and true example of it. Like it, yeah, yeah, it works. And here's an example. It even works in the middle of a of a war. I mean. You could, it's organic. Organic, yeah. It's organic. I I spoke with you know the the thing that with this moral of this, uh, and I'm not even to be honest at this point proposing it as a moral, but because uh, we, I will have to read. I have a thanks to Carla Cativo. I got uh, uh, one book of uh, Paulo Freire again. The basic one. <laughs> uh, so I started to read it again. And at this point, I am not at the level of proposing a model for anything, but I will say we need to read, read pa Paulo Freire. And we need to read uh, community organizing. Uh, but more than read, uh, what we need to read, we need to, if we want to do something like this, we need to do this. You know? We need to organize um, because a revolution is a, it's it's seen as a a war down there and then a structure the party over there you know we we cannot do that it's a, it's not it's it's a, it's action is resistance within the communities. Okay, and a way of resisting in the communities is when you say, well, you know what? I'm going to create a community garden. You know, I'm going to create this and I'm going to work on this. And I'm going to bring the vegetables I get in the community garden and talk to somebody if they want some of those. And let's see what they can give me in exchange for those uh, vegetables. Can you give me some beans? Can you give, you know, so you start creating a network of full sustainability, you know? There is people who has a guava tree and I see them getting, giving me this incredible amount of guava. Then I take care of them, I make them guava jam and I give it away to people who in exchange sometimes give me other things that I need, you know? So those are ways of creating, so we're not consuming in the big market, you know. So how we do that in the communities that help us to sustain ourselves also. And I say, you know what, one of my friends says, repairing your clothes is a way of resistance, you know. Because some people, when a bottom came out, just... Throw it, throw the, the whole sweater, you know, no. I mean, let's fix it, how? Well, I don't know, well, there is a lady whom I know in this community who might teach us how to do that. 
So we can do that, or maybe she will do it for us. And we can exchange something or give her some money, or and it doesn't become this high price organic um, <laughs> uh, thing, you know? And in which people just, just is a, I don't want to label things, but it's a, the new thing. You know, it doesn't belong, it doesn't become the new thing. It builds on what communities have and are already doing. I have a friend who gives me guavas and who gives me figs. You know, and I do the jelly, you know, instead of the jam, and instead of being buying the jam, I give it to someone who gives me maybe squashes or things like that. You know? So, but these existing communities already, you're just building on the capability of those communities. And this is what really organizing takes, takes root, you know? Because you're not coming with Martin Lenin and these huge theories, but you're coming with actual actions and building on those actions, the education, the literacy. In the areas like, I didn't know anything about planting. Well, I knew what I learned in El Salvador in those years, you know, but it's long ago. So I didn't know anything, but then I've been educating myself and learning from others to do this. Oh, this is done this way. Okay, that's why the crop of last, last time didn't work. Now let's try to do this, you see? So it builds knowledge within the communities and it also, so then we can start simply, simply uh, reading the theory about what we would like to build. And remember that Marxism, like you have read him and you consider yourself a communist, is not a dogma, it's a life philosophy. You know, that is still valid, uh, <laughs> that is still valid in this time of globalization. But how we do this is, uh, is a very important, I think, discussion and action. Yeah, no, I mean, clearly, clearly you took you, you, you took a lot of practical material steps to to, just, to, to, to do what worked. I mean, it's concrete analysis of concrete things and just making it happen. It's, it's just really, you, you, you've lived, you've lived such an incredible life and you're so, and you're so, um, you're so generous about, about, about in the way you describe it, so many other people and I don't know, it's very honest. It's very, it's very refreshing. There's a lot of people who, you know, slept in hammocks on, on or, I mean, not a lot of people done that, but like <laughs> people who have are usually pretty like, you know. Well, but, there was a lot of people. <laughs> exactly, exactly. No, that's, that's, it was a really, wow, incredible and immense amount of, of people. And when I think about them and uh, how, that was heroic of those communities to do that. Yeah. Those women who were feeding their husbands, their children in the middle of the control zones, in the control areas, running to the tattoos when they had to because of the bombing. I mean, when the army was going to do what is called tierra arrasada, you know, they will be carrying this humongous amount of things in their heads and walking to the routes of escape. And I'm writing about this too. They will bring the pans, the pots, the minos, the horses, you know, the little Jesus uh, images and things for the Christmas trees. And, and they will be bringing, and I would, I would say, and one of the ladies said, I will never leave this Jesus because it was given to me by my grandparents who, to whom somebody brought them to them from Spain, like one century or two centuries ago. And I will go like, okay, I'm not gonna fight for this. Carry your Jesus, <laughs> child, <laughs> your thing, but hurry up because we are really, we act like a brigade behind us, you know, or with it. 
whatever brigade was behind us and please hurry up. And it was like they will not leave those things. Those were their possessions, their history, and um, the the horses and the mules and the donkeys, all the animals carrying this incredible amount of, of uh, um, maize, rice, beans, so we could eat, you know, we were, were carrying all those things. And it was this incredible movement of people walking and the brigades behind you and in the, during the day hiding themselves in the, in the bushes and the helicopters and the airplanes bombing everything. It was, it was an incredible movement of people. You know, those people, are heroes, what used to be called the masses. Those people are heroes because they kept, they kept and they stay in place. And then after the big invasion and destruction of their little, uh, their villages, there was like 14, 13 villages in that area, people will come and will, um, rebuild their things and plant again and, and start the life of the area until the next invasion or until the next bombing that you have to carry everything in big bundles and carry them and go. And then next to the people walking in those lines will be chickens, pigs, uh, cows, uh, donkeys, mules, as I told you, it was like, okay, and we go with all these children walking next to us. <laughs> we were like, and uh, when the Comité de Propaganda was not built yet, I will carry other uh, committee's things in my backpack and however I could, and all of us will do, you know, with all the people. So, um, it's, uh, those are the things I yeah. remember. Those are the things the people I consider to be the heroes of that revolution. You know, the people who actually made it. Yeah. So we talked a lot about about El Salvador and the, and, the, and the specifics that were going on there and the communities and there, but it, it just seems like that 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 period, the late seventies, early eighties. You have, you know, the Sandinistas come to power. You have in Granada, there's uh, the New Jewel movement with Maurice Bishop, you know, before, you know, sadly assassinated. Um, but you have like, you have a lot of unrest uh, in that period. You have a lot of, you know, like a lot of people fight. I mean, these are these are places that for decades, you know, oppression, repression, horrific. But in that time period, there's all this movement. Well, how do you, how do you, how do you historicize that? How do you look, why? What, what, what was going on at that time period that people um, began to, to really have a lot of success in fighting back. A lot of success? Well, I mean, or, or you know, they were able to, to, you know, wage revolutionary struggle. I mean, you know, back in. You know. Well, could you repeat the question? Because the sound thing is not that great. Well, that, well I'm saying like, why, why did it, why in the late seventies and early eighties, uh, was there was there was there so much fight back? What what, what accounts for that time period? Because um, you see it in a couple different countries in, in the area, you know, in the Caribbean and as well as Central America. Like what 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 was going on at that time period? That, that okay. had fight back? What was going on was an economic crisis. People were fed up. You know, the Nicaraguan Revolution and the Granada Triumph brought big hope in Latin America because it had been like 20 years since the Cuban Revolution triumph, and then came the Nicaraguan triumph, and then the, the Granada, and you go like, and everybody was really uh, with a lot of hopes, you know, that things could change. But not only that, uh, it was not only in Latin America. Uh, we had La Punta de la Lanza, you know, in Africa, uh, Nelson Mandela's uh, organization fighting at that time, also at the same time in history, you know, in Asia, I mean, the Vietnamese revolution had just had an 
1975 had defeated uh, the Americans and had reunified Vietnam. You know, so there was a lot of movements all over the world. You know, in the Middle East, I'm not gonna uh, talk more about that, what happened in the Carter's time, you know, but uh, was uh, very, was all over the world. I mean, uh, there has been maybe a time of uh, a lot of reflux of the movements, but they were starting to reorganize and to regain um, momentum in the world. So, and the economic crisis and hunger is a big detriment of those uh, unrests. So if we, could, if we could move the conversation to your life here in LA, can you tell us about how you got involved with uh, the Central American uh, Cultural Center? Oh, that was, <laughs> okay. So years passed, you know, and then we're here in the United States and we are already established. And uh, this is not the first Central American Center that was created. I was reviewing, I was uh, going through my papers last week, and I found out the first Central American Center that was created out of uh, El Rescate uh, organization members, you know? And there has been several attempts to create this Central American Cultural Center, which right now is in a reflux also, you know? and. Uh, uh, I had participated in two political campaigns, very strong political campaigns for us, the Salvadorians, which was uh, uh, to bring Dr. Violeta uh, to be the mayor of San Salvador, first time in the Salvadorian history that a woman and a member of the FMLN was going to be the mayor of the Salvadorian of the San Salvador. So we have worked on that, and many artists were helping, like donating their work of art. Like I have a donation of, I, I got a donation of like 105 pieces of art to be sold to support her campaign because they didn't have the money to run the campaign. It was really um, the, Electoral College in El Salvador was, or the tribunal, electoral tribunal, was holding their funds that are supposed by the peace accords to be given to each party to run their campaign, were, were hold and will hold from the FMLN at that time. It was uh, uh, always the tactics of the ultra right. So I got involved with this group of artists who have been members of a previous um, of a Salvadorian group called GAS, uh, which is um, uh, it's an artist Salvadorian group of Salvadorian artists, GAS. Um, and they donated their pieces, you know, especially Pedro Cruz and Ricardo Garcia Mimi, and some prints for us to sell them and fundraise. So we were able to fundraise for, for that electoral campaign, you know, that was um, after the campaign for Shafi Kandal as a president. So we made a lot of uh, contacts among us and we realized, okay, you know what? We really need to create our own center because the party is the party and everything a party does is around that party and it's around what the party decides, you know? But we, as a, a fine arts and poet, uh, and poet and poetry and literature and music workers, because to define yourself as an artist is a, is a kind of bourgeois concept, you know, but we, we, we decided to define ourselves as art workers, you know, and uh, decided to, to create a group that was not ruled by any party, but that was very organic. Um, and we started to create the Central American Cultural Center. And that's how I got involved in, in this work. What happened with us at that point is that we had lost 
the practice of organicity, you know. <laughs> and we're trying to create a cultural center from up down, you see? Like, like we, many of us have been part of different uh, organizations of the Farawindo Front. So we all had in, our, in ourselves, many of us had in ourselves, the vertical structures that were created in us again. Not this organic thing that I, we have talked about. And that was maybe one of the reasons that we didn't grow it up uh, um, organically, you know, we didn't organize. And then it turned into a movement of events of different uh, uh, arts, you know, rather than an organic place. But what it developed was a big capability, and this is important to know, big capability of convocation, you know, among artists, among, among artists, artists. And that's interesting because when we will call to a um, meeting, people will show up and they were very happy. But when the responsibilities were assigned, they just didn't show up for the responsibilities, you know? They will show up for the events, but not for the organizational responsibilities. And I think it has to do with how we organize it. You know, it will have to do that in the relearning of, to, of organizing, you know? So, it is still going on within the COVID pandemic, as you know. So we're uh, uh, talking to each other, finding out how's everybody going, or doing some of the like uh, the and the artists start to uh, to talk already that they would like to do some Zoom uh, or a Facebook uh, video. So we kind of it's a convocatory, you know. So, um, but we will have to rethink how we organize. Uh, it's a time of transition, and I guess that the pandemic gave us that space to rethink what we have been doing. Because when people don't go out, they start thinking, oh my God, we do this, we do that, you know? <laughs> and it's like, oh, oh, you know? So that's how I got involved with the organization of the Central American Cultural Center. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um... There's this, this kind of anthology that's uh, widely known and celebrated uh, here in Los Angeles and beyond, uh, The Wandering Song, published by a Teacher's Express. Can you talk a little bit about uh, that anthology and why it's so significant? Uh, it's significant because, uh, and here is the thing, uh, I understand, my understanding is that it is the first Central American anthology published from writers, from Central American writers, that live and work in the United States. You know? uh, there are many anthologies from, from the land, you know, but this one is the first one among people who live here. And it has different voices. And this is the voice from home, you know, which is part of the work of some of us. Now, the road taking, like what we have done for the, you know, and now the new generations that are writing you know, in the anthology. So it's a it's a it's a pretty good group of people they put together, you know, to, to work on this. Um, they did a convocatory, uh, and I remember William Bola de Chicle, who he called himself like that in some of the poem, Bobolgum. You know, he is a young Salvadorian poet who grew up in Pico Union and he saw it all. Okay, so <laughs> he was going center by center and group by group, inviting to the anthology. I remember he did a lot of, uh, he came to the Salvadorian consulate at that time, like we were having a mesa of arte y cultura, and he came. And he was uh, inviting the poets there, and he came to the Centro, the Central American Cultural Center, and invited us. And he went to other areas and invited us. So I sent my poems to the editors 
and they choose one of the poems or to be published. Who I wrote for a Salvadorian poet who felt in the San Salvador volcano in 1990. And there was included my, my work. We have, they, there has been a lot of presentations all over California. I have gone to the one in uh, Beyond Baroque and um, uh, with Antonieta Villamil, I went there and, and presented. Uh, presented with that group. I have not been very active in the promotion. Uh, they are going to do the second edition, I understand, of, of the same anthology, and it's going to be published. Uh, is what I understand they are doing. I have not been able to involve myself at this time because as a, I have had a lot of work since the pandemic started because I'm a nurse. So I have training as a nurse, so we are... Uh, seeing people or helping people to get through this COVID uh, pandemic and trying to keep them healthy and control with their uh, chronic illnesses. So that is part of my of, of why I have not gotten involved in, in so many community activities more than the gardening and and the. <laughs> the planting and the and my work, you know, I'm also working painting. You know, I'm, I'm painting a lot. So. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, your work with a Antonieta uh, in the Casa de Poesia in general? Okay, that was that was an amazing thing, you know, because when I started to write and publish, I started to think, where will I go, and uh, and um, and present my work. You know, so I went to La Luciernaga, which is an organization that has more than 25 years going on here in, in, Los, in LA, in the LA area, um, and Ventura too, uh, who, who are uh, Latin American writers who meet in, with Nestor Fantini in his place for many years, you know. So I go to one of those meetings and Antonieta and Mark are there. Mark Lipman and Antonieta Yamil, and I met Antonieta there, and I had already published the book, and she says, come and read with me, Beyond the Road. And then I went, and I read with her, and she presented my book, and then my second book, she edited and published by Casa Poesia, and uh, we have kept the relationship going in, she has come to the center to read. We have gone to the John Baroque, and she has done a lot of uh, editing of a lot of poems. And also, she put together an anthology for a lot of people in here in, in Los Angeles. A lot of, uh, and this is Latin American writers, you know, not only Salvadorian or Central Americans. Um, that's how I got involved with Antonieta. Uh, she was very kind in um, working in the um, uh, editing my second book. Yeah, yeah, she was kind of incredible. You know, actually, uh, it was more Mark, but but I, my first book was published by Casa de Poesia as well. My first book was published by Casa de Poesia. Yes, I remember. I still have it. And then I still have the, the it was, um, I don't know if it's the first one or the second one. Matt, remind me the name of your second work. Well, I mean, the second full length one, the, the second one was like in a little chapbook, but my second full one is this one right here. No, it's the other one that has a red star. <laughs> the first one, that's the first one. That, that's a, 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 what I might do tomorrow. Or what I might do tomorrow, exactly. I still have it. I just found it in my books because I've been doing a cleaning of my library, you know? Because I realized that in the years I have been in the United States, I have accumulated books and I have given like two full libraries of two big bookshelves away to uh, one to the youth of the Farabundo Martí Liberation Front, you know, uh, here in Los Angeles. Uh, or in a meeting, I came and I brought all my Salvadorian books from the Salvadorian history, and I do not regret it. 
and I gave them all away to that group. You know, I don't regret it. I might need some for reference in some of the things I'm writing, but it was given. And, and these young people read them, I know they did, and they created also uh, a Salvadorian Students' Union in the California universities for a while, you know? So, and many of those young people work now in community um, and for profits, organizations, uh, uh, you know, building strengths and building community. Uh, so, then I have, then I gave another one away, and now I had a lot of books in, <laughs> boxes and I found your book. Well I put them back again out into my into some libraries. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so they, my books are I, I have a new collection that I need to go through again and read some some books I have not read and yeah. books I have but I wanna review them. And yours is I, I got that one for my for my YouTube model. Yeah. Well, this has been a, this has been a real pleasure uh, speaking with you, Dora. What is it that uh, you, you want people to know in this time period of pandemic? I mean, what, what should they be doing? How should they be thinking? What are some of the, the organic ways they can they can organize to better their lives? Yeah, I don't say start planting. Okay, start planting. That's uh, interesting uh, because it does give people food, and it does. Uh, uh, hold on, please. Um, Thank you. So I'm giving you back my key, please, because I need to go. I'm sorry, I, I was, my daughter was asking me to move the car. Yeah, so um, I, I would say that the other thing I will recommend strongly is that if you don't need to go out, don't go out. You know, um, I am recommending seriously, and this is from the pure medical perspective, you know, is uh, wear your masks, you know, and the proper way of wearing a mask is covering your nose and covering your mouth, you know, because and covering your eyes. If you have goggles, that's best. If you have face shields, that's great, because this virus is transmitted through those three rounds, face, nose, and mouth. You know, so... Uh, protect yourself. I have seen a lot of people wearing the mask only in the mouth. But the, the, the virus is shared when you breathe also. If you have it and you're asymptomatic, you still can transmit it to other people. Mm -hmm. So my, my recommendations are those. I mean, the other thing is start reading back again, you know, because the TV, uh, and Facebook too, which I love, is highly addictive. <laughs> and you can spend hours in front of the TV or the Facebook, but I will say get your get your books and start reading them. I mean I'm reading at this point memories from the underground with of Fyodor, Fyodor Dostoyevsky. It's one of his books that I always wanted to read and I have not read again in Spanish because I love to read in Spanish. And um, um I usually read three books at the same time, and that has been me since I'm young. So I'm also reading Ernesto Sabato, and I'm reading uh, Leo Tolstoy, War and Peace, and I still have like 900 pages to go in that one, because it's 1,600 and something. <laughs> so I still have uh, my pages. And, you know, Leo Tolstoy says very clear in that book that he's a member of the aristocracy and that's the only thing he describes, you know, in his book. And that's what he says. I'm not even, you know, but it shed you light on how aristocratic life happened, how they thought, and why there came a revolution in that country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, oh my God, yeah, these people live this way. Oh my God, they have this and the presence this. So you start yeah. to realize, oh my God, he's educating you in how the upper classes lived. And yeah. you're like, wow, well, there was a great disparity. 
you know. So it's how you how you you can approach literature and you can you can read whoever you want to read. Remember to read them in the context of their of the historical period. Because many people speak like, for example, about Ruben Darío as a conservative guy. Well, excuse me, no. The guy build up the language in a way that broke with all patterns. So in his own way, he was a very progressive writer, you know? And even some of the Spanish writers like Iclan and Unamuno had difficult time admitting him, you know, as a writer. Well, he surpassed them all. No. So, and he did work for a newspaper that was about writing about the America, the non-colonial America, you know? And uh, those things have to be, I mean, writers have to be understood in their own time, you know? So I will say that um, I uh, really recommend that people sit down and read again. Because it builds up a lot of knowledge and a lot of uh, imagination and knowledge. You know? And other thing, not to be crazy, I mean, you can learn new things, you know? There is always things to learn that people can learn in, in this time of pandemic. Yeah. So um, with that said, where can people find your book to read? Oh, my God. They can... I have only my third book left, you know, samples of my third book, which is called Al Calor del Fuego. And that one can be found in my, in my, um, well, people can, um, if they want it, they'll do the work. <laughs> yeah, they want the book, they can inbox me and I can make it get to them. Okay. okay. We can talk about it. Thank you so much, Dora, for your time today. I, um, I really appreciate it. Um, it's been an incredible interview. Um, one of the best in this entire series. I mean, the stories you told today are so involving so many people, not just yourself, which are so incredible and so inspirational. And um, I'm at a loss for words. Right? Thank you so much, Dora. Thank you, Matt, and thank you to your cultural center. You know, I understand you guys are in Pomona. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and when this is over, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna get back to, to talking about putting on some events, so. Uh, yeah, putting our paintings and our, the collaboration between the Central Cultural American Center, I mean, the Central American Cultural Center. Well, know? actually, I mean, technically, we're doing one right now because this Zoom channel is the DAW Center's official Zoom channel. So this has been, you know, a presentation with the DAW as well as the University of Florida, so. So we already started. We already started. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate this. All right. Talk soon, Dora. Be safe.